All right. All right, let's jump into our first segment this week. We're going to talk about Tori Amos, Little Earthquakes. And it's an auspicious day in the CTS landscape because Chelsea, John's sister, is on to talk about Tori Amos with us. She is a super fan, uh, self, <laughs> self-described self super fan, or maybe John yes. described her as a super <laughs> fan. I don't know. And, and uh, so we wanted to have her on to get her take on this album and Tori Amos as a whole. Welcome to the show, Chelsea. Glad you're here. Thank you. Thank Um, you for having me. I would call myself a super fan of this album, especially. Okay, good. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. And (laughs) in the opening montage, you heard Silent All These Years, and now you're going to hear Happy Phantom. All right, Matt. What are the crucified. what are the what are the numbers on uh, on this? Yeah, Tori Amos's Little Earthquakes comes in at number one hundred five in the nineteen nineties on Best Ever Albums. Eight in nineteen ninety two. Number six fourteen. I got to get glasses for crying out loud. Six for these <laughs> numbers are small. Six fourteen of all time. Tori Amos's highest rated album on Best Ever Albums. It did make Rolling coming in at number uh, 233 and Tori Amos is ranked as the number 278th highest rated artist on best ever albums okay so Tori Amos was born Myra Ellen Amos in 1963 in Newton North Carolina while her family was on vacation there Uh, they are originally from Georgetown in DC and then they actually moved to Baltimore later on in her childhood Um, this is her date Maryland girl yeah. Isn't she? Hmm. Mm-hmm. This is her debut album and our first time covering her, obviously. But um, but she was in a synth pop band before this, before she went solo called Why Can't Tori Read, which was released in July of 88 by the, uh, under the same label, Atlantic, that she was signed to. Uh, the drummer in that group, none other than Matt Sorum of Guns N' Roses fame. Oh, later wow. On. Um, that, I thought oh, you guys would appreciate that. that. Um, She has 16 solo albums, with the latest being Ocean to Ocean in 2021. She's classified as alternative rock, indie rock, chamber pop, um, alternative pop, etc., all the combinations. The uh, influences are are many, as you can probably guess, Joni Mitchell, Suzanne Vega, Kate Bush, John Lennon, Laura Nero, Peter Gabriel, etc. Similar and followed by... Fiona Apple, Cat Power, Jeff Buckley, Alanis Morissette, Feist, Patti Smith, Regina Spector, St. Vincent, Florence and the Machine. Um, I hear a lot of uh, other artists from, from Tori Amos after listening to this album. Her mm-hmm. highest single is Spark from 1998, which reached 49 on the Billboard Hot 100. Her third album, uh, 1996's Boys for Pele, reached two on the Billboard 200. And some fun facts about her early life in this album. Um, she taught herself to play piano uh, at age two. She could reproduce music she heard once um, beforehand. She was composing Just songs at age three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't she have s- synesthesia, right? Yes. That is okay, one of the gotcha. facts. Yep. yep. She describes. Oh, seeing... sorry. I didn't mean to jump your thing. Yeah. It's okay. She describes seeing music as structures of light, which is known as chromesthesia. Um, which is hmm. very interesting and hard to comprehend. Uh, as my wife said, maybe it's like playing rock band and you see the bars and then the, uh, <laughs> music. Uh, uh, at age five, she was admitted to the Peabody Institute, which is part of Johns Hopkins, and she studied classical piano there from 68 to 74 before her scholarship was discontinued um, and she was asked to leave. She said that she was kicked out due to her interest in rock and popular music as well as her dislike for reading sheet music. And um, Atlantic, she was signed to Atlantic Records when she was 17 after uh, they got out one of her demo, they got one of her demo tapes, and uh, which led to that first band that I told you about. Um, she had a six record contract. So after kind of the critical and commercial failure of, of the, that first group effort, she still had to fulfill her um, remaining records <laughs> contract and uh, Atlantic thought that she would actually have more success in the UK because of the market's quote appreciation for eccentric performers. So the album, this album, Low Earthquakes, 
came out first there in the UK and then a month later in in the US and it was a pretty big hit in the UK right right away and then it was kind of a slow build for for um the US market and then she kind of got this rabid cult following. Um we will be covering Under the Pink later on the season which is the second album. Um so yeah, that's kind of the early bio stuff. So let's start with Chelsea. How did you first hear about Tori Amos and kind of what was your reaction this time around listening to the album? Yeah. Um, so I guess I first was introduced to Tori Amos in middle school. So oh, mm-hmm. probably around 94, 95, I guess I was about 12, 13, which <laughs> thinking back is kind of funny thinking of this like being an album that a 12 year old would listen to, but it's pretty intense. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I was like, wow, I guess that was kind of young, but, um, I, we had just moved to a new school. Um, it was middle school and I was meeting new friends and they had different kinds of musical tastes. So it was Mm. a time in my life where I was branching out from, you know, what was on pop radio and kind of finding new different kind of music. And I had a friend who was like, my artsy friend she was really Mm -hmm. into like female singer songwriters she had an older sister who would introduce her to all kinds of music shout out elsa waldman (laughs) (laughs) so she um she was really into tori amos so i think she also loved ani defranco so she was like kind of of that time period Mm -hmm. i didn't get into ani defranco that much but um i think she gave me this cd and i started listening to it and i absolutely loved it and i pretty much did not stop listening to it for the next two years. I got into her next two albums as well. Um, and I can vouch yeah. for that, by the way, having sharing. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yes, it was kind of like the time, you know, of my youth where you would go in your room, like shut the door, light some incense and some candles, and just kind of <laughs> yeah. like get get into the album. <laughs> so yeah, Jonathan and I, or our rooms were pretty close together. So I'm sure he heard his share of this album as this well. This is a good this is a good album for incense, I feel like. It's, it's yes, kind of, yes, yes, yes. She puts you in a yes. certain headspace for sure. Exactly. A lot of emotion, uh, a lot of intense um music. So So was this kind of your first like big female singer songwriter that you were a fan of or was there people before? I know your mom and parents were yeah were big mm-hmm. music people. Um Yeah, I think she was the first. Um and you know, again, it was the time I was discovering new kinds of music. So mm-hmm. at this at this stage, I think I also really got into Janis Joplin. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd start listening to her and I would tell my parents, like, Janis Joplin is so good. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> we know Janis <laughs> Joplin's good. So I really got into her. I think I started listening to, like, Stevie Nicks. And, yeah, so I was just kind of into that female singer-songwriter vibe and, as soon as I started listening to Tori Amos, she was just like nothing. She was like no one I'd ever heard before. Her voice was so different and so interesting to me. And just the the piano that she plays um, with her songs Mm. is so dramatic. And I was just so taken in by the whole album. It was the first album and probably one of the only few albums that I've ever just listened to every single song on the album, like cover to cover, know every song. Um, I don't typically do that. Like I'll, you know, pick the songs that I like, but this one, I would just listen from start to finish. And it's funny when I was revisiting it, I, you know, listened back to it. It's been a while since I've listened to it all the way through, Mm -hmm. but I still know every word, every beat, every piano chord. I, it just is so ingrained in my memory. So it was great to revisit it again. Yeah. That sense memory for, for these yeah. kind of important albums is we've all had yep. that, I think, listening to um, one album or another on here. Do you, um, yeah. and I can totally see like how me back. this would like be impactful to a middle school girl. I feel like, this, yeah, she, for sure. you know, it's, it's like mature and mm-hmm. kind of weird in a good way and really kind yeah. of off the beaten path. Um, yep. And if, I guess it feels adult too, in a way. It- for sure it felt very adult and it felt you know it's like an angsty time and Mm -hmm. she certainly has lots of emotion strong emotion she's pouring into these songs and um yeah and also she's quirky like she's off the beaten path for sure she's she's different she's like no one i had ever 
um, known at that point. Um, I guess the comparison that I kind of made at that point was to Kate Bush, just yep. because my dad listened to Kate Bush a lot. And yeah. I kind of saw the um, the comparison there, which now looking back, certainly they're very, you know, they have lots of similarities, but um, I think I related to that too. Just, you know, she was kind of quirky and kind of different and I like that. Yeah, I definitely thought of Kate Bush listening to this. She's definitely yeah. a, kin, a kin, uh, kindred spirit. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. safe to say that UK market thing might have been influenced by Kate Bush. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> We've got one of these <laughs> that's already. True. Let's see if we could do an American <laughs> one of them. For have, sure. you, have you stayed a fan uh, through through the first three albums? Are you listening? Have you listened to our more recent albums or anything like that? You know, I have to say, I, I started with this album, immediately got into Under the Pink, which I also absolutely love it has probably my favorite tori amos song on there Which um one's that? and then uh that pretty good year okay is just one of my favorites nice. i had a friend that used to play that on the piano and it, it was, it's just such a beautiful song hmm. um and then right when boys for pele came out i got really into that too so i think it was just those three albums really after that i kind of fell off and i i know she's had so many albums since then so i haven't stayed that um, connected to her music since mm -hmm. then, um, but these for these first three albums, I was just listening to on repeat. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Have you seen her live before? I haven't. I almost had the opportunity to see her live, and I wish that I did. I was. That's one thing I was going to ask you. If during your research you came across any videos of her live performances, because there's a, yeah, there's a bunch on YouTube, but I didn't watch it. Yeah, anything. yeah she is incredible like she i would say she's probably better she sounds even better live than she does on her her albums which is you know impossible and you can really see what a talented like classically trained <laughs> vocalist and musician that she is she sounds so clear mm -hmm. every note is i mean she varies her songs a little bit live but She's so clear. She has such control in her voice. And her voice is just amazing. I mean, she's got that range from like that high soprano and then she goes real low um, and she's kind of all over the place. And it, it's just captivating to watch her perform live. And just visually, she's <laughs> so interesting. She's got that fiery red hair. Mm -hmm. She's got bright red lipstick. She's so dramatic when she's playing the piano and I mean, she's just like very, very um, interesting in her live performances. I'll say that moving all around, playing the piano, and just really cool. yeah. I, I imagine she would put on a really good live show, and especially with like yeah. a fan base that's really dedicated to her. That always makes makes it I, kind of more. I would yeah. recommend. Recently, she did a tribute to Dolores O'Riordan when she passed away. Oh, uh, oh. sort of kindred spirits as well, uh, and mm -hmm. Sinead O'Connor even more recently. Oh, wow. And so I came across, you know, her doing songs of them and the Sinead O'Connor one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of fellow travelers in terms of being iconoclasts. And if you're going to start mm -hmm. somewhere recently, I'd, um, I'd go there. But yeah, I mean, that, that 90s period of her, she's a powerhouse. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, will, I will say, check it out if you haven't already, because <laughs> it does add a special sauce. Yeah, those, yeah, yeah those I wish I could have... Uh seen her live at some point well there's still there's still time I was about still, to say, there's still yeah. time that's I true saw, she toured in 2023 i saw so i'm sure oh, she'll, really? she'll tour again this yeah. is gonna be my you know time to to get back into the tory fandom for sure yeah. <laughs> get on it she could uh, people are passing left and right these days so, <laughs> i you know, know. You never oh know gosh. especially after that josh that talks that. about him the grim reaper over here he's always talking <laughs> about on. dead people that's We'll have yeah. to run the stats on that. I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> How often no, has Josh long... killed an artist on CTS? <laughs> long live Tori. <laughs> yeah, really. So, Chelsea, this time listening to it, you know, coming to it with adult mm -hmm. experiences yes. and, and mm -hmm. reactions, what what did mm -hmm. you think this time around? I mean, again, I, it, it transported me back to, you know, when I first started listening to the album. And it is funny now to listen to it as an adult with, you know, more of a critical ear. I wasn't yeah. exactly analyzing it like that um, as a kid, but um, it just struck me again, how she, you know, in, in the flow of this album, she has so many different styles. Like it's not mm -hmm. consistent in one type of 
style. She has um, songs like, you know, Silent All These Years and Winter, which are just beautiful piano songs, you know, mm. really soft and beautiful. And then out of nowhere comes Happy Phantom, where you're like, huh, this is <laughs> this is interesting. This is a little bit different. It's like a bouncy kind of piano um, tune. And then, um, you know, more dramatic um, songs like uh, Precious Things and Little Earthquakes. I mean, she really just kind of goes all over the place with her style. Um, and Definitely. yeah, it, and another thing that I love about her music is, you know, she'll start a song in one style, you know, soft piano, um, kind of almost whispering in some points. Mm. And then all of a sudden in the middle, there was just an abrupt turn to like dramatic piano her voice changes she starts singing like really loud and making like all kinds of weird <laughs> sounds with her voice yeah um like yeah my favorite is i think it's uh is it precious things where she has just like that primal wail in the middle of the song mm -hmm. so yeah she she definitely takes and especially in her later albums um there you see much more examples of this where the song starts one way it completely changes like three times throughout the song and doesn't even sound like the same song but then she kind of returns to the beginning and i i just always love that it's kind of always unexpected with her yeah they the songs have these like this dramatic build to them and, and yeah like, there's big crescendos and kind of like yeah all the feelings come out at, at once yeah uh, she like yeah. freaks out for a little bit and then she's yep. she's back <laughs> reigns it back in yeah yeah Almost and like on boys for pele yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good one boys for pele you really see um this taken to a new level with her you know how the songs just go in five different directions and you're like am i still listening to the same song mm. um but you get a little taste of that in in uh this album too so you think that album kind of i, I saw somewhere reading a review of this mm -hmm. that like this album is her most accessible album do you think the for newer, sure the later albums kind yeah. of become more experimental in some way for sure i mean this is like the the gateway into her music um yeah. you probably don't want to start with boys for pele because she gets progressively more quirky and like a little bit wacky in her songs but again that's what people love about her she's right. just very unexpected and eccentric and um her music so unexpected but um this album i think definitely has the widest appeal um it, when i first started listening to it I Crucify was the song that I had heard before. So that definitely, mm -hmm. that got some radio play. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Silent All These Years, I think is a song that a lot of people can can hang with. Right. Um, but, and Tear in, Tear in Your Hand is another one that I thought could have been like a radio play song. Um, but yeah, as she gets further along in the albums, especially with Boys for Pele, gets, she starts bringing in like the harpsichord, and yeah. that, that starts getting pretty intense and you know she really uh leans into like those her using her voice in different ways she's making like a lot of guttural like <laughs> sounds in her singing and going up and going down and um i i love it like i love that album but i think you know i had some friends that were into her and when they got to boys for pele they were like i don't know i, I don't think i can hang with this anymore <laughs> this is getting a little weird <laughs> so uh yeah i think that you need to have a, a special place to to continue on down that path with her yeah bri bridge too far maybe for some people yeah <laughs> don't start there start with this one <laughs> nice so matt what about you what did you think about listening to little earthquakes yeah so i i so oddly enough my son we were talking about before this we yeah. started recording. My sister's a big Tori Amos fan. I actually texted her when I started listening to this. And I was like, are you still a Tori Amos fan? And she's like, yes. And she's like, under the or, under the pink turns 30 or turns 30 this week uh, or whatever. So and I just looked it up and they just, yeah, January 31st wow. at uh, 30 years old. So we are, we're, Actually. yeah, we're just, all these albums are like 30 years old, 40 mm -hmm. years old. It's like, yeah, that's bullshit but um so i never really <laughs> well, listened to tori amos you know my sister my sister did um like you you guys chelsea and john my our rooms uh -huh. were next to each other so i would hear things here and there and just upon you know on surface level passing by or hearing things i wasn't really uh, this this was not 
resonating with me at the time that my <sighs> sister was listening to this. So I kind of was just like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. I just you were too too in off. your toxic masculinity. At that That's time. exactly <laughs> right. I was very much in my very toxic Long masculinity. Then, so. Weren't feeling those like angsty preteen girl. <laughs> no, vibes. it wasn't the ang- no the angsty <laughs> angsty girl vibe. No, not, he was feeling it just me. for the men. He was feeling yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. He had his I liked my man. angst yeah. as a with men. Um, <laughs> so right good. up to new metal for him too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I never, and I never, it's, it's another one of those things, right? Like uh, going to college, all of my friends, music friends, nobody was like a uh, big that I knew of was like either a big Tori Amos fan or one that was playing it around me or encouraging me to listen to her. So it just never, it never hit on my radar. So this is the first time I've really listened to this record. Uh, my initial reaction was, okay, Kate Bush, right? Like it's yeah. like right off the mm-hmm. beginning, Crucify. It's like, and now I know Kate Bush because we covered a couple of her records and it's, it's very much in that, you know, it's kind of that uh, it's dramatic, right? Her sound is, I would, I would call it, it's, it's very dramatic, theatrical in, in a lot of places as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very eerie and spooky. You know, there's a lot of minor, a lot of songs in minor keys, minor chords, and which I generally like, right? Um, it's, it's kind mm-hmm. of got this, there's like a, a sinister vibe amongst a lot of these uh, songs as well. Um, uh, and so, and, and then also drawing like more contemporary artists that or you know that Josh was you know certainly Fiona Apple kind of came up as somebody that 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 a lot of parts here were were resonating with me and and some of the a no, no, number of the other artists that you mentioned so so I did really like this particularly the first half I thought that that was definitely stronger than the second half um, I mm-hmm. agree with you Chelsea I like how there, there's a lot of variety on here I mean it's still at its core it's, Tori Amos on th- at the piano, but um, she's she is exploring a lot of different sounds, a lot of different almost genres, and just incorporating you know orchestras and mm-hmm. and guitars mm-hmm. and drums and you know just kind mm-hmm. of contributing to it. Or she's or it's just her and you know in a piano, right? Um, and uh, I I really th- th- it's a really interesting record. There's a lot of cool things happening here, and. Um, you know, I, I I really enjoyed the first, yeah, the first, God, the first six songs. Like that whole first mm. side is just like Murderer's Row of great songs. I loved Precious Things was a crazy song. That one kind of took yeah. me by surprise. I actually was thinking later on this week, I was as it kind of is building and building and doing all these crazy things. I'm like, I honestly felt like it's a little Radiohead-esque in the sense that like, hmm. it, it not just their drama, it doesn't... S- in and of itself, it doesn't sound like a Radiohead song, but but kind of the movements and where they place, like, just here's this big, all, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this guitar riff, this or this guitar yeah. chord that just sustains, and it's like, okay, and then it becomes orchestral, and it's like all these movements and stuff like that, and it's it's kind of got a complexity that something like a Radiohead would do. Um, so I thought that that was, was, was very cool. I do like her voice, um, and I, I would imagine that seeing her live would be quite uh, mm-hmm. impressive as well. I mean, just... just she's got to be moving so fast up and down the piano with her, with her, with her hands and stuff like that. And certainly if you probably want to see her, you, I would want to have a vantage point of seeing her play, you know, when, when yeah. somebody like this, she sit, sit st- uh, stage left, Chelsea, if you ever get, get stage left, yeah. Chelsea, you can see her going, you know, with her hands and stuff like that. For um, sure. yeah, oddly enough, my sister's never seen her either. So I was like, how do you, you gotta go see her, you know? <laughs> I know. Uh, and she, and I she mean... else, oh, go ahead. No, I'm saying, I'm sure that is just, such a yeah i think her live performances just really show how yeah. unbelievable i mean she is i think she's like a musical prodigy i mean she was like five when like she it. was accepted yeah. to some you know fancy music school and um you can really yeah, tell i mean right. just seeing her yeah yeah and seeing her you know sing and how talented she is at the piano i i yeah that one day one day I'll yeah yeah um so yeah so I, I really did like it it lost me a little bit kind of toward you know in the second half um particularly the one two punch of leather and mother um i wasn't mm-hmm. feeling those as much uh leather was kind of like it's almost like something from a show tune a little yes. bit like it's it kind of seems a little a little out of place even though it's a record full of songs that are from you know kind of all over the place it just it didn't that that kind of thing didn't hit me what she was doing there didn't hit me as much. And then mother was, a, 
it, it was good. It was just, it was a little long. It's almost seven minutes long. And uh, I just, I didn't, I wasn't hooked in as much with that as I was with a number of the other songs. Um, loved Tear in Your Hand. That was great. That My sister said that's one of her all-time mm. favorite breakup songs is how mm. she described that. So, oh, um, so and mm. then Me and a Gun, I, I, the, oh. the acapella spoken word I, uh, that didn't that, that was that's like a skippable track for me it's just um as you guys know i like the music it's, I, she's got a good voice but it's uh, i'm not really here for that necessarily but i love the way that it ends with little earthquakes so um so overall very solid record um i get it now after all these years of just like not thinking about this at all but yeah very solid thumbs mm -hmm. up uh very interesting uh record and uh kind of unique we haven't really covered a ton like this I, I would probably say the closest that we have covered to this would certainly be kate bush um you know but uh i i did quite i did enjoy this quite a bit yeah what about you john yeah i i kind of look at tori amos as interesting in that she continues down that road of the the female singer songwriter right so in terms of our journey i'd say start at laura nero who i think she has a lot of commonalities with in mm -hmm. terms of her mm -hmm. voice i think there's similarities there moving into the Joni mitchell carol king lane right the confessional singer songwriter you know that's where and laura nero is that too but Joni mitchell with the way she uses her voice as a, a sort of a an extra instrument Right. And takes different takes and, and delves in right. different styles. And Carol King with the traditional songwriting, because even though there's all these things, it's actually tied to a pretty basic pop song structure. Right. But in it, she's deviating all over the place within four minute songs. Right. Mm -hmm. She's not going nine minutes or, you know, one minute thing. She's largely mm -hmm. staying in pop conventions. You know, then fast forward. Obviously, we've mentioned Kate Bush in the sense that there's I also want to mention that she is a lineage to another thing that I'll get to in a second that she shares with Kate Bush. But yeah, Kate Bush sonically, Suzanne Vega is another person mm -hmm. we covered who I think she has a lot of similarities to. Um, and then you get her, you know, and then I would argue that she continues a lineage that is then followed by people that come shortly afterwards that, you know, Fiona Apple, you mentioned is the, probably the easiest one, but Feist, is another person I think shares some similarities. There's a little bit of similarity um, with uh, with a lot of different mm -hmm. people. I could sort of delve into it's Regina Spector. I think I've heard Regina Spector, like, Saint Saint Vincent. There's a little bit mm -hmm. of overlap with I think at times too. But so she's a continuation of that. Then she's also a continuation of this. I make music that is as a decidedly feminine. And uh, mm. from a women's perspective, but I want no part of like being a traditional feminist. I'm a third wave feminist. You know what I mean? And like I so and she's very outspoken about that and always has had kind of like a difficult relationship with feminists. Right. Which she shares in common with Joni Mitchell, who famously mm. did not want to wear that. Right. Shares in common with kate bush who remembers she's like no like i'm david bowie i'm not yeah. carol king <laughs> right like i make music mm -hmm. for aliens and everybody not you know for you know i'm not going to carry the women bridge like i want to be free of that you know like and stuff yeah. it's but they were decidedly feminine tori amos is that lane if we continue later right someone like lana del rey has taken that to, right, yeah. you know what i mean like i'm I not making music for just women i'm a woman and i'm sexy and i write about female themes but I decidedly also want to embrace like this nuanced, sometimes even traditional view of women. So she's in that lineage as well. Mm -hmm. And then she's also in this lineage of like women of rock in the 90s, which we're just tapping into right now because we haven't gotten to some people we didn't mention that I think she shares some commonalities with too. PJ Harvey a lot oh, as I yeah. listen to this album mm -hmm. I'm like boy she has a lot in common with PJ Harvey in that they write a lot of songs about sex but they're obtuse songs about sex and also they're mm -hmm. like weirdly childlike as well and that's when you mm -hmm. guys were saying oh it's adult themes there are like I'm gonna write mm -hmm. about my rape but there's a childlike yeah. nature to Tori Amos too and that's where she shares something in common I think with PJ Harvey and Kate Bush who at times come across mm -hmm. like almost like you know nature child you know what i mean like yeah. part right. woman part fully realized woman part you know little girl childlike wonder at times mm -hmm. and listening to this album i know you said menacing 
Matt. And like, I get it. Like there, there is, but I didn't feel as much ominous as I feel like it's more like a sense of wonder, but the wonder coming from all different types of things. Lyrically, um, you know, she's dropping, and you mentioned this, Chelsea, we were talking about it. Um, Tear mm -hmm. in your hand, right? Is her first, you know, Nine Inch Nails reference there. And she's, you know, often writing to Trent Reznor in there. And there's some lyrics in there. I was chuckling knowing that because there's oh, a yeah. direct reference to Nine Inch Nails in there. Um, I have a funny aside to that, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she I'll, had I'll, a... Mm -hmm. Go, Go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I was going to mention that, that she had a friendship with Trent Reznor and they both would reference each other in their songs at times. Mm. Um, and interestingly enough, <laughs> I think he mentioned in an interview, their, their friendship kind of got, had a rift at some point, which I think he mentioned in a, in a magazine interview at one point was caused by Courtney Love meddling in some way. <laughs> and, um, of course, which I of think course. is like the most nineties story ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a song, uh, on, voice for Pele, Professional Widow, that they think she wrote about her um, and kind yes. of, you know, they whatever have famous, she did. They have, yeah. uh, Courtney Love's got like three or four major feuds <laughs> and like all oh, of Riot sure. Girl, you know, like all of the Riot Girl acts like Kathleen Hanna and stuff's one of hers and yeah, Tori Amos is another famous one uh, that she has. Yeah. But but going back to, so thanks for adding that because that, that adds <laughs> the color there. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. I, I, obviously, I like this album because strange outside the box female albums are kind of like my lane at different stuff. And that's what this is another um, in, a, in all the right ways, right? I love like interesting, you know, from from outside of the norm oh. views of topics that are universal, but you're like, this is, I want to hear what this person's take on these is because it's not going to be a, it's going to be atypical, which I love people coming from that. That's where she shares something similar with Fiona Apple who kind of does the same thing. But I just, mm -hmm. I want to end with, I think it's going to be really interesting to see all of these different views of how to do women in rock. Like, because, you know, we're going to see Liz Fair soon who's like sort of this like every guy's dream rocker chick, right? Writing confectional songs, right? Like blatantly, explicitly, right? Like songs mm -hmm. there. Then yeah. you're going to see like PJ Harvey, who's almost like non-binary at times, like with how she does it. She could be like super sexy and feminine and then also like very guttural and like aggressive, like taking on mm -hmm. name traits. Like Tori Amos is sort of like art house, but also resilient then you've got like sarah mclaughlin natalie merchant like mother feminism gonna you know be more yeah. first wave feminism like girl power you've got an african-american feminism coming you've got like the courtney love like unapologetic feminism and you get like all of these you get gwen stefani right who's bringing like a, i'm you know strong but also like i like the idea of getting married and having three kids and i sing about mm -hmm. it often and there's all of these different versions of like what being a woman is where i think we can all admit that almost everybody says like in the 60s 70s and 80s you were either like you know <laughs> a matron right a sex symbol or like odd and you, yeah. you got to like sort of operate like out and like some people got to be the lane where they didn't totally get judged by how they look. And like we can count on one hand who they were, right? Kate Bush, Joni Mitchell, you know, there's a couple and like only a few of them get to that rarefied air, right? It was either like you're talented, but you're like not attractive or like at some degree, it's always going to be about looks. And the 90s is sort of where, you know, someone like Tori Amos sort of was definably feminine but also, and attractive in a, in a classic way in some ways, but also you never like process Tori Amos as a sex symbol like at the time. And that's really a thing that I think is starting to come into place in the 90s. So, uh, but yeah, this is a thumbs up for me. This is a really good album. And I know I didn't go into the, the particulars mm -hmm. of the music of it and I can go there, but I, I want to give Josh a take and there's four of us. So it's a little bit. Um, yeah. And Matt, and, Matt mm -hmm. and Chelsea did a good job of describing how this album sounds. And I would largely agree with what they said. Yeah, add, adding mm -hmm. to what you guys said, I also really like this album. I found we haven't heard too many artists that are so um, foundationally piano as kind of the primary focus. Mm -hmm. It's always kind of an accompaniment often in in albums that we hear. So it's not a it's not always like a strong um, uh, you know main focus of an album. And, and so I thought that was a that was an interesting appreciation um, appreciative 
deviation from what we normally listen to. Um, I there, her lyrics and themes are so self-confessional in nature that it's it's uh, I don't know. I really responded to it in sort of a like reading a diary sort of way and and it's so kind of intense at times on this album um you know especially me and a gun which is Mm -hmm. about her her rape and once i picked up on that you know Mm -hmm. lyrically it it kind of like took it to another level for me um i actually didn't know her music at all i i knew her uh in reference uh because neil gaiman one an author and comic book writer um based uh, mm-hmm. a comic character on her delirium and so she name checks him in tear in your hand and yep. um, they're a like couple friends. songs actually. yeah and so i kind of only knew her based on that character and not her music so that that's kind of funny but um i really like how she arranges the songs i really like the strings that she that she adds to um back the piano it, t- it adds like a grander nature to the songs and you know it, it's dark at times too but but not like so dark that it's oppressive. It's, it's, I don't know. It's true. in in some way it's a, uh, it's realistic. And that's why when something like happy phantom came on, it felt more <laughs> kind of like a relief in a way. And, and um, that's not to say the album is heavy, but I, I appreciate the, the range of kind of emotions and places she's willing to go. Um, I agree with you, Matt. I think the front half is kind of my favorite but then, like the back half, the back part with "Tear in Your Hand," "Me and a Gun," and a little and little earthquakes is is a a real great capper um, to to finish off the album. I, I guess it's really kind of the middle three songs that I didn't have as much uh, of a connection to. But you know, she's writing about religion, she's writing about her rape, she's writing about childhood and growing up and motherhood and all these kind of big themes and. She does it really well and in kind of an appealing way. I got the Kate Bush Would you say, connection I, too. I think where but... she's similar to PJ Harvey is desire for things, like all kinds of things, is a central Tori Amos theme. I think like yeah. desire for understanding, spiritual fulfillment, relationships, motherhood at times, all these things. Right. I thought that was like a, a central theme of her songwriting. Right. Yeah. I don't. I'm not familiar with PJ Harvey, so we'll see when we get to to that album but yeah this is a great album it's a great first album and i'm excited to kind of listen to listen to the next one and see see where she goes i think if you like this album you'll like under the pink too i think it's um you know it's got some different songs on there and like i said she gets progressively just a little um you know pushing the envelope in certain ways but Mm -hmm. i i think it it's a good like transition to that album i think you'll like it Nice. Yeah, that sounds good. Any final thoughts before we close out? For me, I'm just, you know, happy to hear that you all like the album, too. I was curious to see what your thoughts would be. Um, so I'm glad you liked it. it. Like I said, it's such an important album to me when I think back to, you know, my musical history of my life. And um, it was really fun to go back and listen to it again. And now I'm like, reinvested and listening to all of her music and <laughs> yeah. maybe i'll check out some of her <laughs> later go on the deep dive too. yeah well, well, and, sure. probably, <laughs> and it's funny too how more. like I was, I was just gonna say it's funny too how like, you know because i've had this experience too where you're saying oh yeah. the first three albums i love so much it's so great me it's so meaningful to me and then <laughs> when you think about what came after that or like what she's done recently or you know the artist that 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 artist that we love so much at a point in our lives and then it's just like for whatever reason they fall off our radar and we're like are they even still making yep. music you're like what are they doing you know and so it's 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 a it's an interesting dichotomy that i i, I have certainly have fallen into that before as well yeah same well and and i've been doing a deep dive of the albums nominated for album of the year this year listening to them Mm -hmm. and i think it's it's very notable as we do this that five of the seven were female singer songwriters taylor swift olivia rodrigo lana del rey janelle monet and um Mm. uh who am i missing uh miley cyrus Mm. right so five of the seven are to some degree right Uh, yeah for the grammys writers so the grammys yeah yeah Yeah, grammys yep so i think it's interesting that's where we're at in music now this doesn't stand alone yeah, you know, really. or, or this type of music is is the primary music driving the critical charts now. Yeah, I hope there's another little girl out there putting on incense in her room and shutting the door and just 
vibing yeah. to these <laughs> I'm sure that's happening. That has to be happening. It's, it's out there somewhere. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the world needs more uh, Tor- Tori Amos fans. So. Sure. Well, th- thanks so much for coming on, Chelsea. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and giving us your thoughts. And uh, it was fun hearing kind of your experience with the album and, and revisiting it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.